My idea is to make you an overview of the how brain research has evolved in this last, I would say, 50 years. And uh, I will start with the concept that the brain is the result of a successful evolution. Uh, uh, Gina said that this is because we a, a, a movement was necessary for animals to, or for living beings to uh, reach an appropriate place to eat and to reproduce. And he puts the example of this ascidia that <coughs> in the larval stage has a brain. When it goes to the rocks, he fixed on the rock and became a big stomach and the brain is reabsorbed. Something that always, Rodolfo says, happens also to university professors when they get tenure. <clears throat> the point is that from this very elementary brain devoted to direct movement, action, we arrive to the human brain that in which this process has been become completely sophisticated so that finally the uh, search of the prediction of the uh, consequences of that movement is what the brain has achieved with evolution. And as a result, the brain has a large variety of functions. We, it is useful to explore the external world. It is able to develop very sophisticated motor tasks. It has developed the capability of interaction among individuals and other animals as social behaviors. And it is reinforcing certain behaviors like reproduction and maternal behaviors and rejecting a potentially dangerous or injurious stimuli through the development of the reward and the pain systems. But we should not lose the idea that finally what the brain is trying to do is exactly that, to reproduce, I mean, to prolong the life of the individual long enough to allow its reproduction and the transmission of these genes that <laughs> Sidney was talking about. Uh, for that, the brain really builds a completely distorted picture of the world. We don't see the world as it is. We have a completely altered, biased, and limited perception of our world. We don't see ultraviolet lights as um, bees do, or we don't hear ultrasounds as dogs do. So from that point of view, with that example simply, the idea, the, the perception that we get from the infinite spectrum of energy, we just collected, detect the energy that is relevant for this survival and for this reproduction. But doing that, the brain has done a remarkable work. And we are able to construct with a very limited information always a coherent and continuously change picture of the world. So that this is, for me, a very good example that I tend to put here because, because with very few traces in these two completely different sketches, Picasso was able to present and to make us to recognize immediately two uh, women and realize how simple is the, the traces that are necessary for us to identify the subjects of the paintings. But the consequence of that is that the brain is cheating us all the time, so that we have sometimes completely confused perceptions. And if you try to, the elephant is very famous lately. And as you see, it's difficult to recognize how many legs is. We will never answer that question. Same thing with the size of this or this that are the same, and so on. And probably Magritte, with the capability that artists have to say what we, it, it takes us years to, to find. Uh, when he uh, painted this, uh, this uh, painting, exactly reflect what I'm trying to say. This is not a pipe. This is 
the image of a pipe, but not the real thing. Uh, brain research and, in general, neurosciences, uh, the problem is that we were dealing with an extremely complicated uh, organ. And as was commented by Dr. Brenner a moment ago, a reductionistic approach, in my view, also is the most efficient way of solving some of the questions that we have in order to understand how our brain operates. And uh, I have to put here the figure of Ramon y Cajal, who was the founder of neurosciences, because he was the first that was able to define in scientific terms how the brain was organized. And just to mention, he discovered that the brain was composed by individual elements, the neuron. He was able to show that these neurons, they have uh, uh, the dendrites in which the information was directed from the dendrites to the cell body and from the cell body to the, to the axon that was the output. And that allowed him to, to design the circuits that composed the brain and was the first step to disentangle the, the network that apparently was a sensitium without, without order and without any systematic organization and allow us to understand that there is an order in the development of the, of the um, brain. And all that was done on morphological basis. But soon afterwards, the language of the brain was discovered when uh, Loredrian discovered or recorded for the first time an action potential. The action potential is a very fast pulse that lasts less than one millisecond and that runs very fast, is conducted from one neuron to the other. This was a giant step and in this last 50 years we have reached, and these are the people who did a significant part of, or the, the seminal part of this work, Hodgkin and Huxley finding the ionic basis of action potential of, of electrical changes in neurons, and um, Erwin Necher and Bert Sackman um, being able to analyze the ion channels that support these electrical changes. The point is that the nerve impulse is the signal, the language that is used, is codified, and I will show you later some of those action potentials at work, is the, the, the way that one neuron communicates with the next. And I have to put here this picture that for the young people, they may recognize that this is the Palace of La Madalena. That was taken 50 years ago. This thing over there is me. So <laughs> remember, with Lord Adrian, with the discoverer of the action potential, that was, a, a, he got the Nobel Prize in 1927, if I remember well. So neuroscience is a relatively new science, and that gives you an idea of how things have progressed since that in a relatively small number of years. The second point, Cajal also discovered the articulations, he called, between neurons. And uh, these articulations were called synapses. And synapses, the communication between, between neurons, is something that uh, is important. Uh, it doesn't work the, the... OK. Anyway, the transmission between two neurons is a critical process in which a very controlled and sophisticated process from the the concept that neurons talk to each other by the release of a chemical substance between them, we move to the understanding of how these chemical substances depolarize, that means activate the following neuron. And today, we know, we know a lot about how the synaptic connection is made and how the proteins of these synaptic connections are organized. So we are able to understand 
how the neurotransmitter is released by one neuron and is detected by the second neuron and how this process takes place so that one of the big possibilities of what I said up to now in order to think in the future of biomedicine would be to apply this knowledge to understand how this um, a mechanism can be used by the human brain in order to communicate a specific group of neurons so that we can manipulate in the best sense of the world. We can change, modify, or correct alterations in this process in order to maintain the normal connections and the normal activity between neurons. As Dr. Brenner also said, the problem we have with age is that we lose these this connections. I mean, the organization of the connections, particularly in the, in the cortex, in the spines, the, the point where, where synapses are made, which are these spines that were discovered uh, long ago and that I didn't show you before, but develop very fast in the child from the, born, from the birth until the adult age, and they are pruned so that these synaptic connections that Cajal predicted were the place where the memory was stored is, are the, the points in which interaction, specific interactions between neurons take place. And as I say, the problem we have is that those those uh, spines are physically disappearing with age so that uh, we lost connections and we lost capability of memorizing and organizing knowledge. A remarkable thing is that we discover, we have discovered in the last years that the, these connections are not rigid, permanent. They are extremely plastic so that Knowledge means, in many cases, development of these new connections, reinforcement of those connections. And uh, uh, in general, the uh, ability to memorize things can be simplifying simp in a simple way, said that is the result of the connections that the new connections that neurons establish to organize new circuits. And the work that has been done in this direction is, again, remarkable in the last years. Memory is more and more understood uh, because of the uh, uh, detailed knowledge of how activity increases the efficacy of synapses and how these connections, when they are established new connections, how they are reinforced by experience and by the arrival simultaneously of information so that these connections are reinforced. Of course, another field that has evolved at a tremendous speed and that has brought a completely new view of how to understand the brain is the genetic and molecular characterization of the brain. After the statements of Sidney Brenner about the importance of molecular biology, I will go very uh, smoothly over this subject, but I think we all are fully aware that the next step for us to understand the brain is to be able to mm, find the pieces that we can put together later on in order to understand the functions of the brain in a progressive way, every time more complex. In that respect, the, the contribution also of the study of development and of nervous regeneration that was the strategy used for by Cajal again to understand the complex structure of the adult brain using embryonic, uh, the embryonic brain is giving also a lot of rewards to us because we are understanding at the molecular and, uh, level how the brain is organized, what molecules are going to define the way that these 100,000 million neurons establish an average of 1,000 connections among them in order to build the complex circuits that sustain our brain functions. This is just to speak about, this is an, 
a discharge of action potentials to give you an idea of the speed at which we, the brain works and the neurons work. This are the, that was the effect of warming a peripheral neuron and how, uh, uh, warming not, sorry, cooling a peripheral neuron and how the cooling produced this discharge of nerve impulses. Those nerve impulses enter into circuits and as I say, if we want to understand the brain, now we need to understand how the different neurons build the circuits that were outlined again by Cajal because he put based on his uh, neuronal theory and the, the, uh, act the polarization of the neuron theory, he was able to um, outline or to imagine how circuits in the brain could be organized. And he put this arrow that they show 100 years later surprisingly accurate in the way he designed the anatomy of the brain circuits. But now we are trying to understand the physiology of those circuits, how they work and how they produce functions. And in that respect, the contribution of David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel uh, after the pioneer work of Sherrington and John Eccles that were the, the, the first in attacking the problem in the case of John Eccles with microelectrodes and then in the, in the visual cortex, they found the principle that there is a, a progressive a, um, complication of the circuit so that there is a hierarchy in the way that functions are organized. Uh, um, isolated information coming from the periphery is converging in neurons that everyone connects with other in a very specific way so that the final result is the, uh, of one neuron is the, that neuron in the final will be activated only when a number of very specific peripheral information is converging on that neuron. And I put the example of this work of, of Rodrigo Kian Quiroga in, in uh, Oxford that, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, uh, this is a shame, it's not in Oxford, it's in Leicester, I think. <laughs> so at least a peripheral university, they do good things also. Uh, uh, he was able to show in human patients in which he was recording for uh, uh, um, intractable epi uh, epilepsy, he was able to discover that a, a, one neuron will respond only when one concept image was shown to, to the person, to the awake patient, human patient. This is in, in the internal temporal cortex. And what that means is that some neurons will fire only when a certain type of information is sent to the brain, not by other images that can be as known as the one of Whoopi Goldberg, but only that neuron will respond only to that phase. And that, of course, shows that the uh, organization, the general organization of the circuit is so that the final grandmother neurons are there to collect a very specific information. And perhaps this is the basis in a very rough way of how information is stored in the brain. Uh, I want just to mention that new technologies, as happens in everything, are critical to advance, and the, the, the development of optogenetics is representing a huge step, in my view, in the future to stimulate selectively the uh, uh, specific neurons with light, something that is the result of a, a very good combination between genetic tools and electrophysiological or uh, neurobiological uh, uh, questions. Uh, of course, brain pathologies has been extremely useful to understand many of the ailments of the problems of the human brain since a number of very classical uh, data. But uh, in recent times, uh, an advance has been represented by a more holistic approach to the, to the brain function through the brain imaging. I am not so enthusiastic about this technology with all my respects because it is uh, making a new functional neuroanatomy in real time of a brain function. But finally, we are going back to localization of functions through this technology, but is undoubtedly providing extremely useful information about how the brain works. I think this is one of the futures of, 
of the analysis of brain function, both in, in normal conditions and in pathologies. And new techniques like tractography, et cetera, are being used for diagnosis in a very important way. But combination, combination of genetic tools with these new techniques are, in my view, very uh, promising to understand some of the problems of human behavior. So we need to combine circuit analysis with uh, brain imaging and with uh, the genetic basis to understand some of uh, the important behaviors in human, like this warrior gene that apparently, as, as I say, I don't believe in a single gene for that, but is associated with, with directed and logical violence. Uh, the other thing that I think, in my view, is going to be extremely um, fruitful in the, in the next future is the interaction between brain and machine. I think um, um, uh, Sidney Brenner was saying that we can substitute cells by culturing them. In the brain, I think this is going to be quite far away from us because to reorganize these circuits that, as I say, 100 million neurons connected in a very specific way 1,000 times and changing those connections is not an easy task. In that respect, the possibility of stimulating specific areas of the brain to induce or to, to recover some function like this in this, in this experiment in which a stimulation of 50 neurons in the, in the motor cortex is able with, through a computer um, um, is able to reproduce exactly the movement of the of the animal that I mean the, they are recording the activity of the of the cortex in the animal and the animal is directing this artificial arm through a computer and in in recent times the stimulation with um, uh, optogenetics of retinal both the remains of the photoreceptors or uh, pho uh, photopigments introducing bipolar or ganglionar cells is probably becoming an important way of recovery of vision in people that has damage of the peripheral retina. Another very interesting and promising technique is deep brain stimulation that was used for motor problems and now is using also for uh, uh, problems of the problems of the um, um, a, a, a more behavior associated problems like a, a, a depression and so on. Well, I will end up by summarizing very fast what in my view is the medical and social impact of brain research. Of course, brain diseases, brain diseases, they represent in Europe 50% of the charge of disease in our world because nobody can cure them. So the problem is that they are becoming a very serious problem and in particular, major depression is one of the, of the major problems in, in our modern society. But in my view, the importance of brain research is not so much to cure diseases, which is important, of course, but the, the impact that the knowledge of the brain will have in how our society is organized. With knowledge of brain, um, of brain mechanisms, we can attack in a rational way why and how drug abuse and, and addiction uh, develops. We can control emotional states that are taining all our behavior. We can uh, analyze the brain mechanism of empathy, of fear, and violence, which are very serious problems of our society. It is already feasible to, de determine, to determine legal responsibility using neuro, ne um, brain um, recording and brain imaging techniques so that we can, at this moment, uh, find in, in, with a more object, in a more objective way some of the problems associated with the administration of justice. And now there is, a, for me, a bit um, dangerous new uh, uh, discipline called neuroeconomy, where they, our uh, mechanism to do decisions, to adopt decisions, is being dissected so that uh, the products, new products, can be sold through the use of uh, um, appropriate um, um, brain techniques. 
And of course, there is the possibility that is already there. We are already doing that where we can evoke in the brain with artificial external stimulation, we can evoke feelings, behaviors, emotions by external stimulation. And we can use that for therapeutic purposes, but all those things are opening. And the last, but in my view, and I agree with Sidney Brenner, the, the uh, possibility of understanding how we learn, how the children learn, how the people learn, how we can optimize the way in which the brain collects and, and analyzes information. I think brain research will bring this. And all together, in my view, I am a biased, enthusiastic neuroscientist. Uh, the knowledge of the brain will deeply influence the future of our society. Thank you very much.